All right, so we're talking about the uh, third quarter of Middlesex here. And I noticed that on page 252, um, right smack in the middle of a book called Middlesex, we have a chapter called Middlesex. All right, because after those race rides that we talked about, and uh, um, <clears throat> they took the insurance money, they were able to buy themselves into suburbia. Um, and uh, and I, I, I think it's one last kind of sort of a nod to that racial divide in that they are supposed to be kept out of suburbia based on their Greek heritage, but because they're able to uh, pay in cash, they're able to get in. Um, they find this little loophole. and uh, But uh, again, it's a loophole that only parts of civilization at that time, only parts of America would be able to use. And uh, it's, it's just kind of a, another way of showing all these like divides that, that we have throughout our our, our society and the way that we kind of artificially try to create them um, and their role in our identity in, in that development. Okay, so this move is a huge, huge thing that happens in, of course, Cal's development. Um, pay attention to architecture. If you look back at the house in Hurlburt where Lefty started the speakeasy in the basement, all right, the structure of that house with the speakeasy in the basement parallels and matches the structure of that family and what was going on in that house, right? Middlesex is no different. In fact, it's even more so. And so I won't spell it all out to you, uh, but you know, do read through that chapter or reread that chapter uh, with an eye for that, right? The ways in which this, this house and this unique architecture being both futuristic and outdated at the same time, uh, how it reflects the characters in that house, in particular, Kale. And then, of course, all the, the other aspects that, that, that are brought in, like uh, the, the floors and the nooks and crannies and the different ways that it challenged uh, the idea of being just like two floors, right? Of being like this dichotomy. All that stuff is, is in there. And I've probably spelled that too much already, but, but do look through it. And like each of those little details is, is integral in, in the kind of like paralleling Cal and this family and uh, gender identity in this case. All right, so uh, we're on Middlesex Boulevard, and it's like it's, there's a lot of like tongue-in-cheek humor in this in this part of the book. Like it gets really like kind of serious and dark, and then it just throws in like some kind of like joke like that, and it's like very punny, right? Like like this, um, but it does base a lot of this on real life. Right? Middlesex is actually a road with some weird houses on it outside of Detroit. Um, <clears throat> so, anyways, uh, yeah. So 258 is another place where we have this this house description. Um, that is uh, so apt uh, to its inhabitants, um, right? Who else would buy that? Thing? Actually, it sounds kind of neat, at least if you're a kid, not if you have the Sisyphean task of washing windows. Um, and if you knew Greek stuff, you would know who Sisyphus is, has this eternal torment of task of rolling a built boulder to the top of a hill, let it roll back down. And so Lefty, that's like his, his penance, right? To constantly just wash the windows over and over again right, because of the way that he hid things, perhaps. Um, all right, so in this house, uh, we have um, one of Cal's first awakenings with uh, Clementine Stark. Um, and so uh, it's, it was, you know, again, like they're, on, on some level, you can read it as like kids exploring and things like this. Um, you can also read it as perhaps a product of the, the lack of conversation that happened in that house, right? Uh, notice those things that, that even like Milton would say, right? Like, oh, that's not my job, right? And it was like, well, you know, uh, you know, he has a pit, pizza, and well, we just don't talk about that other thing. Um, there's a lot to be said about about that, and, and there's actually a whole like uh, uh, category of literary uh, lenses or studies that is called queer theory that, that looks at that, looks at how um, what is unspoken and unsaid in literature kind of reflects what happens in life and reflects um, anything that you know historically we didn't fit into, sort of like cisgender and stuff like that. Anyways, um, <clears throat> the description though is it's almost like primordial, right? Like there, it's, it's, it is the corner of this sort of this birth or awakening. Um, and of course, then we get to puberty and a lot more of this bio biology motif is kind of inter interstream here, right? Because not only is biology like a huge part of our genetics um, and, and, and who we are and our identity, uh, and, and like we said, it's, it's all intermeshed, right? It's, it's our upbringing, it is our history, it is our genetics, it's all these things that make us who we are. Um, it's one of the points of the book, right? It's not nature versus nurture, it's nature and nurture. Um, but uh, 
<clears throat> but here we also have changes, right? We have certain changes that happen that biology is kind of responsible for. And so we, we get back into a lot of this biological language and even biological imagery, right? Because this is what Cal is, doesn't know what's happening, um, is expecting one thing to happen, right? And those of you who read, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and, but it doesn't. Something very different is happening. And um, so I guess he tries to fake it until he makes it, but faking who you are can only last so long. There's also this, this sort of like irony, or it seems like irony at the time, and later on you realize it's not that irony, uh, except, except that the adult count tells you this is not what actually happened, right? Like like riding a bike into the uh, to protect the family business, <clears throat> he says it's not, uh, uh, wasn't his male instinct, right? But we're like, yeah, but it kind of sounds like you wrote it that way. He wrote it that way. Anyways, uh, he goes right down those stereotype lines on 278 as he talks about God had given me all the important ones. Mathematical aptitude to chapter 11. Sorry. Cal got the mathematical aptitude to chapter 11, got the verbal aptitude. To me, fix it handiness to chapter 11, imagination. To me, musical talent to chapter 11, looks, right? Um, looks to me. Uh, so, so Cal, right, gets, gets the looks. Let's go ahead and, and skip to the school that she goes to, sorry, the cal, the cal that, he, that he goes to. Um, and uh, uh, so Cal goes to the school and it's in suburbia, right? And, and, and more of that biological language comes out in the primordial soup that is the locker room. I don't know if you guys remember the Miller-Urey experiment from biology, uh, but um, you know, the, 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 the discussion of like changing is, is pretty interesting. And, and so we have both like the Greek Stuff like Dionysus strewn throughout, and Medusa, right, with the Medusa hair that uh, uh, you know, Cal just hides behind. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but then we also have all this uh, biological stuff, right? Talking about like phylum and, and genus, right? Remember all that uh, taxonomy and classification stuff on 296 and 297, right? The, the charm bracelets were like, like the, the top of the food chain, she says. Um, and it says, you know, there's no evidence against it genetic determination more persuasive than the children of the rich. That's the charm bracelets, right? But back in the way back of the locker room, right? With, uh, you know, again, she talks about their adaptations for fecund to be more biology terms. Way in the back, beyond the charm bracelets, I passed next into the area of the kilt pins, the most populous phylum in our locker room. Okay, we're going through the biology language. And then way the very back is cow. And this is, this is you know, a lot about, tells a lot about self-perception. This is where he perceived himself on the food chain um, in a society. And I waited until I, uh, they left before I undressed, and then I wasn't naked for a second. It goes through the whole thing. Right, and so this is, on, on one hand, it is like kind of like a, a preempting, um, you know, chaos discovery of himself. Uh, on another hand, it is like a very real and secure, you know, Thing that happens to both guys and girls um, at, at this, you know, in, in the puberty and in locker rooms and stuff like that, and, and, uh, and it, it does become a, a, a food chain of sorts. Um, and then we get, of course, the, the Medusa hair, uh, which, which hair, you know, is, is oftentimes a, 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 a common symbol, uh, a trope or archetype, if you will, um, and so it can uh, represent feminine beauty and youth. Um, but I think because of that, it can also come to represent feminine power. Like in the case of Medusa, right? This hair of snakes that could turn anybody into stone, right? Interesting that like feminine power becomes evil, but um, uh, for for Cal, it becomes a way to hide, right? Uh, hide who he really is from others, from himself, from whatever. Um, and then, of course, the, later on, right? The, the, and we get to the last quarter. Um, pay attention to that because hair will again become an important part of identity. Then we have we have a lot of like phallic imagery throughout this. All right, and, 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 and if you go through like a second read, it makes more sense because we have um, uh, Cal is chromosomally male going through puberty, expecting to go through a female puberty, but on some level actually going through a male pre-puberty. And so like just kind of sees phallic 
uh, symbols everywhere. Um, and then even like makes jokes about it with like the cigars that he smokes later on in life. Uh, he says it's not a, an, an overcompensation, but maybe it is. It's just kind of this joke he and Julie Kikuchi have together, right? Um, and thank God for Julie Kikuchi. I don't know uh, like how far you've gotten in that, but you know, for 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 her to come in and Kev's life later on and be like, hey, all all beauty is freakish. <laughs> you know, and, and you kind of pair that with the the charm bracelets in that primordial soup of a locker room. Um, that's uh, probably an important thing to hear. <clears throat> okay, anyways. Um, so the obscure object, I've right, got to talk about her. Okay, this, this is uh, the, the second character that we have that, who is never given an actual name, uh, so it's not 319, uh, but is in, in fact identified through her uh, role. Chapter 11, bankruptcy, obscure object, taken from actually a, a an art, view, an art film is the obscure object of desire. And this is the thing that finally pulls out of Kale um, what he really is. Right? Um, and so, uh, whereas as, as, as Kale is an outcast in a way he doesn't want to be, the obscure object is kind of an outcast in a way that Kale would like to be, right? Kind of a rebel. Um, they, uh, uh, and, and even like describing like her face and stuff like that, like, Again, on 226 and 227, using more biological words uh, because that's what's happening within camp, biological changes, right? Um, so anyways, uh, uh, they get closer, right? They're in this play. Cal plays Tiresias. If you remember the, the beginning, this is another kind of tongue-in-cheek, punny kind of joke a little bit uh, in, in that Tiresias, remember, was changed uh, from male to female for seven years by Hera and uh, then later changed back and when... You know, a bunch of philosophers asked Tiresias, for whom was sex better, right? He gave this sort of cryptic answer. But all of that, right, Cal playing Tiresias in the play, a little bit of foreshadowing, we might say. Um, and so through the obscure object, we meet Jerome, okay? And uh, Jerome is a vampire. Like, literally. Well, no, not like literally. Like, figuratively, but like, he's playing one in a movie, literally. Uh, so, so, you know, a vampire uh, is, tends to be older, richer, paler, dark hair, right? Preying on young girls. This is exactly what Jerome does, right? So it's just kind of like another pun joke that he's making a vampire movie while acting like a vampire in real life. Uh, as in, you know, uh, the predator. But meanwhile, of course, you know, Cal's affection for the object is just growing and growing. Um, and uh, then he gets to some, some tricky bits. Right when they're at the uh, the cabin, right, um, and you know Cal does take on the, the part of the aggressor, and he even says in adult life that that he does that to an extent. Um, you know, only will only get so uh, close to a girl, and he's you know he, he talks about you know uh, doing the, the typical male thing of getting close and then leaving, um, but it's really about for Cal a fear of intimacy. This makes you wonder, maybe that's what Eugenides was saying that is a case with all males. Anyways, um, there's, in, in that moment where it happens more than once, the obscure object is pretending to sleep, um, but then assisting and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, I'm curious to see how this ages, right? I, I went to the student and said, well, you know, this doesn't sound like consent. And that's a very good conversation to have. That's the conversation we should be having. But if anybody's going to get me tuned in this, it should be Jerome. Um, and the, the, I think that the, the point of that scene, however, was to to show that there's these desires that the extra object won't admit to. Um, the same as with Cal, right? And, and 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 you can maybe do an argument about how Cal is just kind of like repeating what he's seen in society because this is like something that we never like really consciously thought about as a society. And and so finally we're we're, we're doing that, taking a step back and. and and defining this thing, and that's great, right? Um, but anyways, yeah, there's there's a bunch of uh, uh, places we can go with that. But yeah, if you're gonna meet to somebody, definitely out Jerome, um, the vampire, you know that guy. Uh, and so, you know, Cal, like kind of like peer pressure, or whatever it is, I don't know. Um, has that weird night with Jerome as the obscure object is with Rex on 375 and so forth, uh, which leads us to the chapter called "The Gun on the Wall." In each of these chapters, like the, the titles are, are the title like this on purpose, right? And so he talks about like check off, right? If there's a gun on the wall, you gotta use it. Another phallic image. Oh my gosh! Um, but it also means that hey, something big's coming, right? Uh, this thing that's been inside Cal all these years since the beginning of his book, 
it's got to come on eventually. <clears throat> and, and, you know, it says, like, Act 3, well, it's about where we are in the, in the book here, isn't it? Um, all right, so, uh, I'm sure I does have various ways. She showed that she has uh, feelings for Kale, right? And that happens. Um, drunk gets jealous. They wrestle. Uh, Cal, you notice, is all of a sudden kind of strong. Hmm. Um, and it was exhilarating to be on top of him, but not in the way of what we might think on 392. It was in the way of like being on top of Chapter 11, who had pinned her all, sorry, had pinned him all his life. Um, and so then you know, Cal runs away with pumping thighs and knifing arms, another Greek mythology illusion, uh, and runs smack dab into a tractor. And there is the gun on the wall, fired off. Uh, because the good doctor who is not, Dr. Phil, who is not old world, who is out of the microcosm and has better eyes and better modern practices and notices that um, something is not what they think it is. I don't want to say something wrong because I don't think that's accurate. And so uh, this means that Cal is going to go see a, a specialist. Cal goes to see Dr. Luce in New York. Um, which who is most likely based on Dr. John Money, um, who dealt with like the Beamer print and stuff like this. It'll be interesting to see what your your takes are in, in your generation because things things have changed a lot in the last 18, 20 years since this was written, um, and in, in in our conceptions. And you know, I think our I think for the better. Um, that's the idea, right? We progress as a society, move forward, make things better. Yay.